I'm the head of uh, cyber defense and strategic programs in Airbus Cybersecurity France. I joined the cyber business about 10 years ago. At that time, cybersecurity was an emerging domain, which has grown into an extensive and uh, dynamic activity. So in this talk, we'll discuss what have been the major trends and strategic shifts in France along the 10 years and how the French institutions and also our company addressed the new cyber challenges. And of course, what will be the next steps? Welcome to talk.cybercni.fr. Welcome to Talk Cyber CNI, the uh, monthly cybersecurity speaker series. Finally, we also have sound, which is very good. My name is Marco Oliver Pal. I'm the head of the chair of cybersecurity for critical network infrastructures. And today we have the third and uh, or even fourth and finally successful trial for the long awaited uh, talk on Airbus cybersecurity 10 years of challenges and opportunities. And we had quite some challenges in the past with the hardware from my side and also other difficulties that we had. And therefore, I'm more than happy that uh, today I can uh, welcome uh, Nicola Razzi and Nicola Lorio for this talk. The speaker series uh, also. made some uh, summer break and therefore I'm very happy for welcoming uh, many of you uh, online today and also on site. Uh, today we are at Euricom in Nice in France, one of the schools I have Institute in Telecom. And uh, the speaker series, as you know, has the goal to bring cybersecurity closer to a broad audience, so it's about informing you about challenges and opportunities of cybersecurity. And actually, we started the entire series with Airbus um, back uh, in uh, January, I guess. Let's just have a quick look. On the 16th of June in uh, 2020, we started the speaker series with Frederic Jules, and uh, therefore I'm even more happy to welcome uh, today uh, Nicola Razi and Nicola Lorio from Airbus. So you uh, just heard the uh, the trailer. You heard what the talk will be about, and uh, as usual, I will quickly introduce our two speakers. So the first is Nicola Razi. Nicola Razi graduated from Centrale Superlec and joined Airbus Defense and Space Division in the C2 and Secured Communications business lines. He is now the head of cybersecurity, defense, and strategic programs for France. Welcome. And the second one is Nicola Lorio. Nicola Lorio graduated from FREI Paris and Repari and joined Airbus Defense and Space Division in the cybersecurity business line. He has mainly worked in the IT and mission system area, but with various experiences in the OT sector, such as in the telecom, media, and various vehicle domains. He is now senior expert cyber defense at the Airbus Cybersecurity Technical Office. And before we come to the talk, let me introduce uh, this leader once again. I just have to copy the audio source from here because I was missing so one second. Okay, now you should hear me again, uh, but you're not seeing me, so one second. Okay, this one. Okay, so now I'm back. And now I'm also back in my frame. So as usual, we have this leader on the uh, left side of me. You see the link. So it's uh, cybercni slash 20. And uh, you can also just uh, click on the QR code here. I will uh, show it also throughout the talk. As usual, the format is that we have um, 45 minutes of presentation. And then afterwards, we have 45 minutes for question and answers. And so do not hesitate to connect to the second screen and to put all your questions in there. 
And that said, we come directly to the talk. And I hand over to you, Nicolas. And uh, Nicolas. Okay, so let's start with that. So I'm Nicola Razi, and uh, Nicola Mario is uh, in, is a business me. And actually, I'm going to Nicolas for the price of one today. Um, we will talk about ever cyber, cyber security as it was in uh, the last uh, 10 years, but there were also some changes in our organization. So we thought that uh, even before starting uh, really the uh, talk. So just to give up of uh, who we are, uh, our cyber security was uh, in the part of our defense and space, and our defense and space uh, um, as a, uh, a program unit or business unit that is called Connected Intelligence, in which there are uh, some uh, secure communications, military intelligence, and of course, cyber security. So uh, along the last 10 years, our uh, business was twofold. First, there was a business uh, uh, focused on uh, big defense programs. And here we are uh, talking about a large program on cyber defense, crypto, secure gateways, and so on. And the other part of our business uh, was the focus on services. And here we are more talking about uh, risk management, consulting, uh, managed services such as a uh, security operation center, and this is more of a business that is focused on European institutions, private companies, and the group Airbus uh, itself. And uh, on the 1st of July, there was a new company called the Airbus Protect that was created inside of us. So now there are two sister companies doing cyber inside of us. Airbus Protect is Still focused on the services, delivering services to internal and, uh, and uh, critical national infrastructure. And we, Nicolas and myself, are working at Cyber Program, which is still inside Airbus Defense and Space and still focused on the uh, defense program. So, this is more on this side that we'll uh, talk uh, today, but we'll uh, also uh, have a look at. Uh, Critical national infrastructures, of course, and, uh, and the European institution uh, to some extent. Um, before uh, starting the talk, I would just like to talk to you, uh, take the opportunity to talk a little bit about our uh, our um, teams because we have fantastic teams and they are doing a great job, and uh, I would like to thank them for that. Uh, here are a few uh, a few pictures of them. At the last uh, FIT event uh, in, uh, in Lille, uh, when they carried out demos, uh, hacking uh, challenges, and so on. So, uh, if before anybody asks, uh, uh, yes, we have uh, really uh, good experts, and we are, we are recruiting. So, if anybody hearing is, uh, is interested, there is all the information uh, necessary on LinkedIn to get in touch with our uh, HR colleagues. Now that it is said, uh, let's come back to today's story. Um, so, Airbus Cyber Security, before it was a uh, cyber program and uh, Airbus Protect, was created about 10 years ago. And during those 10 years, uh, we, we thought that it would be interesting to, to take a step backward to describe what, what happened during those 10 years in the cyber security, and especially in France, because uh, we are French, we are working on a French business. Uh, and of course, it won't be uh, fully uh, comprehensive because uh, we cannot uh, say everything in 45 minutes, so we focus on specific uh, topics, and um, uh, we, we, we will try, uh, to some extent, to, to have a look also at the European uh, landscape. So, to put it in a nutshell, we will describe how the threats evolved along those 10 years, what strategic decisions were uh, taken by the French institutions and the French decision makers to address the cybersecurity state the way. Okay, so this is more or less the agenda for today. And actually, I've been talking about 10 years, but uh, the sort of story will be uh, all that. Because I said there were some major events uh, happening before uh, those 10 years, it's more like 12, 15 years ago. 
the, the, one of the first uh, important events that happened was in uh, 2008, a uh, cyber security attack that you probably know about, about that, uh, that was uh, done on Estonia. So these attacks took and uh, disrupted the Estonian society uh, for uh, two weeks. The parliament, banks, ministries, media were attacked. And this was one of the major eye opener in the end of the year uh, 2000 uh, for political and uh, military decision maker. For example, this, uh, this uh, event led to the creation of the NATO Cooperative Cyber Security Defense Center of Excellence in Tallinn. And this is uh, something that is uh, very famous to know. And uh, actually, this attack uh, set the scene for the decision makers to reflect on how cyber could be part of warfare operations. And actually, quickly, at the, roughly at the same time, there was some, some, some really uh, strong decision taken in, in France. There was a white paper released in 2008, which is called the Libre Grand, de la Défense et Sécurité Nationale, National Defense and Security. Um, that was uh, meant to define the strategy of uh, the French nation for the following 15 years. So this is a very, very big book, and right? this is uh, something that is uh, some about uh, 400 pages big, and this is uh, far beyond uh, the simple cyber security uh, topic, and because it addresses uh, um, land army, uh, uh, nuclear deterrence, and so on. But still, for the first time, the word cyber was mentioned in this, uh, in this book. And it was mentioned only six times, but despite it was only six times, it's clear that the topic was already important because cyber security was uh, mentioned as a sovereign topic, meaning that it must be kept under control for the independence of the nation. And to some extent, it means that it's uh, put uh, at the same level or close to the same level as nuclear deterrence, ballistic missiles, or, uh, or nuclear power uh, uh, submarines. So it's clear that the lesson from Estonia was heard, and that's not the only event, but uh, that's, that was one of the events. And also this uh, white book mentioned the risk of a major cyber attack in the next year, in the following years, against the nation of critical national infrastructures. It mentioned it would be very likely to, to have this risk. So to put it in a nutshell, this white paper shaped the political and military view on cybersecurity for the for the following years. And there were some uh, very practical uh, consequences. For example, in 2009, there was the creation of the NSSI, which is the French National Security Agency. And this, is, this was done in the tra straight line of the recommendation of the, of the white paper. And actually, there was already uh, an agency beforehand, but it was really focused on the military side. And this new agency focused on the protection, progressively you know, focused on the protection of the information system of the governmental bodies and also on the protection of uh, the critical national infrastructures. And we'll see later how it uh, it uh, new. So it's important also to note that uh, the NSSI has a very specific position. It's really focused on uh, defense and protection, not on collecting information about, uh, uh, about uh, other stakeholders or on offensive cyber. So this is very different from other national security agencies, uh, which, uh, such as the, the NSA, for example. And this is a bit uh, reassuring for other red stakeholders because they, uh, the NSSI uh, can easily work with uh, administrations, companies, uh, industries, or international uh, actors uh, with, without any uh, risk that they are thought of as, a, as offensive. So this was one of the first decisions for the white right book. And then the, the NSSI delivered a national strategy for defense and IS security in France. So this strategy was, was uh, described four major uh, objectives that structured the, the way 
of how the cybersecurity will be handled. And the domain of dependent uh, to protecting sovereign information that the critical national infrastructure protection should be strengthened and that uh, security in cyberspace should be ensured. So this was the main backbone of this uh, strategy. And maybe talk to you, uh, Nicolas. I, I, I will get into a little bit of uh, two, two other big maps. Well, the first one was Tax 19 to 17, uh, which demonstrated that the, the cyber is used as a weapon against uh, the industry. So Stuxnet is a weapon whose one it was uh, done to uh, tackle uh, uranium enrichment, uh, so against uh, SCADA systems. So, this is a really well famous uh, malware. You can find a lot of information around uh, the internet. But in this big picture, this was still another eye opener because uh, it was another uh, proof, if we need some, that the malware, so the cyber, can be used as a, an offensive weapon to, to tackle some, some issue or to fight against some uh, other country. And we have another example, which is also sabotage in 2012, uh, which is uh, Shannon. Uh, Shannon was also uh, uh, a malware which was developed and mainly was targeting the national oil companies uh, in the Middle East, particularly uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, there are uh, been more than 30,000 uh, workstations which was uh, uh, just impacted by, by the attacks of this uh, block during two weeks. Uh, the, the company and the challenge did, did come back so uh, again in 2016, 17, and 18. So these two other examples is Estonia was three big examples among others that said the, the cyber weapon is really growing as a as a, as a trend, so I would say for, for some country. So this leads us uh, in the same part uh, that we, we decide uh, in reaction also in our business space to create a, a cyber security competence center. So this was a, a, a joint uh, of various people inside the, the Airbus defense group from uh, French, UK, Germany people uh, in order to develop the, the cyber business and try to protect the, this kind of industry, defense and uh, critical national industries. Uh, we also uh, did uh, do a, a huge program for the French MOD, uh, which was in, in line of the strategy, which is called uh, uh, NTD, which uh, stands for the technical units for uh, the, the cyber defense, I would say. So we were a, a huge provider that have been started in, uh, as, uh, as we can see in the picture, 2011, and uh, we, we are delivering the two links for the, the French MOD year around yes, detection and cyber defense. And uh, 2012, uh, this was in another big uh, date, I would say, in the agenda, it's a big A, big a because uh, we, we go from uh, 10 just uh, uh, competent centers to uh, start a, a company, a subsidiary, fully dedicated on cyber defense. For, for us, it was a new start in 2012 as a company fully dedicated to, to fight against cyber attacks for uh, MODs and uh, national uh, critical infrastructure architecture. So, yes, just, just to introduce uh, the next year, uh, until 2012, I would say that it was a time to, to put down the foundation. And then the three uh, following years, uh, the, the focus was on the actual implementation, how uh, the protection would be put in place and to, uh, to uh, uh, protect against uh, cyber attacks. Yes, and what, one big decision in, inside the average cyber security at the state, it was to join people inside the same building, inside the same department to create what we were calling at the at this stage at the cyber defense centers where we were putting all people which were delivering uh, activities for cyber defense, which was uh, everything around the supervision operation center and also uh, uh, computer uh, security uh, incident response team. So we, we decided to put all these people 
uh, in addition also the other people which have to support to deliver to to integrate the system inside the same building at the same floor so this was a joint and extended team uh, together it was a strong decision on our side and uh, also this was uh, the, the, the the building for us that we will talk about it today we able to not only tackle it stuff but also everything uh, along the OT uh, because the the perimeters like also OT uh, search. So uh, part of the picture also we did APT1 report. Uh, it was uh, at uh, 213. Uh, the, the, the APT1 was the first report done by uh, Mordiot. Uh, it was uh, really uh, a huge uh, I'd say discovery for Mordiot. We were not that much technical. It was also another eye opener. Uh, and the reason why is when we, we had the report. In fact, the, the APT group was uh, at least acting since uh, 206. Uh, it has done more than 150 uh, victims over seven years. So uh, it was really a huge discovery for some in, in, inside the industry uh, and really eyes open us that we can also sabotage, as we have seen in the, in the slide before. But here we are also talking about espionage to steal that, uh, and stuff like that. So, and the average, uh, average, uh, <coughs> I would say time inside the network team was something roughly between uh, one to five years inside the victim before I just discovered that he is under attack. So it was really, really uh, an important uh, date also to, to this report for some in the industry. Um, inside of it, we have seen that the, just uh, as I said before that we have done the the MTV for the French Medi. During this decade, we have also done the tactical capture for, for the, the technical means for a uh, soft annotation purpose to deliver to the French Medi the capacity to go, uh, let's say, on the field with the means to do cyber defense purpose. So it was the rising defense also to for everything operation with the uh, data tools on the set. And uh, during that time, the national authorities carried on structuring their uh, approach and they released a second uh, white paper, which is uh, close, uh, the follow up of the one that was released in uh, 2008. And uh, actually, this one is much smaller than, than the other one, so three times smaller, but cyber, uh, cyber security is uh, mentioned uh, seven times more than in the previous one, which shows that the importance was really increasing on cyber security, cyber security uh, especially with political concerns. So this uh, white paper is very important also because it's the political foundation for the military government law. And we'll come back to, uh, to that. Uh, this law uh, was to come the year after. And uh, about cyber security, this uh, white paper acknowledged that there was an increase in number of threats. And uh, also that there was uh, actors uh, that were really interested in using uh, cyber for edge robot, and uh, um, that uh, we needed to put a person can answer to the threats on critical national infrastructures. So this means that some security cyber specific schemes were to be developed for critical national infrastructures, for example. Compliance with the standards and the frameworks, uh, the need to put in some uh, specific detection device, uh, the need to declare security incidents to the national authorities, and also the possibility for the state to carry out uh, compliance audits and to ensure appropriate measures were implemented in, uh, in uh, vital uh, companies. And this led to the LPM, the military programming law. This is the legal transcription in uh, 2013, uh, in 2014 of the white paper in terms of law, law that applies to uh, every company. Uh, and this is called the military programming law, but this is both on the uh, uh, only military sector and especially it applies to what are called the OIV, the operators of vital importance, 
it defines some uh, PID points of vital importance for the national infrastructure and so on. And this law, this law with, uh, with the law of the state and more particularly the NSSI to impose protection measures on private actors and on other CNIs. And this, this law also uh, opens the door to a national qualification, uh, for example, in terms of uh, of uh, audits, uh, there is the passing qualification that uh, um, that, that applies to uh, to service providers uh, uh, for audits. There is the PDIS qualification for the uh, service providers in uh, incident detection, the PRIS for incident response, and all those qualifications are developed by uh, the NSSI. At the same time, there was a ramp up on the national uh, ecosystems. The first things on that, and you will see that uh, it's something that is very important in, uh, in the cyber security domain. So, for example, the Code of Excellence Cyber, Code of Cyber Excellence in Brittany was initiated by the French MOD uh, along with the Regional Council of Brittany. And it also uh, includes uh, actors from uh, defense industry, private, private and public sectors, uh, big industrials, SME startups, and so on. So th this is uh, some kind of community that is focused on cyber security, um, training and research, the development of innovation, um, support of trusted services, both in, uh, in France and in Europe, and so on. So to put it uh, in a nutshell, the Pole of Excellence, Cyber Excellence is really a, a key actor for developing a sovereign and also European cyber security uh, ecosystem in Britain. The next point is uh, another, uh, another uh, yeah, that's not an attack this time, but another event by, uh, that uh, is linked to the release of uh, of some information, some links by um, our friend uh, Stuart Snowden. So, what is important here is that uh, we understood, we learned, maybe we already knew to some extent before that, but we learned that the NSA was uh, using tools and processes, for example, to intercept for phone calls for millions of Americans, to tap the phones of uh, allied leaders, and especially in Europe. So this confirms, once again, that there is some kind of industrialization that is ongoing for cyber weapons. And, uh, and there is some kind of race for those cyber weapons uh, ongoing. The next point is about uh, TV5 models. So this is uh, actually one of our customers, so we'll speak a bit uh, more than that, because uh, that's not often that we are uh, able to speak about what we can do and what, who our customers are. But in this case, it's uh, public, so, so there we can, uh, we can go. And I did let Nicholas do that because he was uh, very much involved in that. And just, just hearing also not uh, the most story in what that time and we cannot disclose everything. But yes, we were part of the, of the team that is uh, joined with others. We were not alone uh, inside the, 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 the CNN and say that, that it was a, a cyber attack which has tackled a, a French uh, TV which is uh, broadcasted over the world, not only in France, but mainly outside, outside France. And, uh, so there is a kind of uh, geopolitical impact beyond the, this one. And uh, because there are more than two hundred uh, millions of viewers, I think, uh, around the world. So it was really uh, an important impact because there is a black screen. Uh, and uh, for the TV, this is worse case you, you, you can have. The Airbus was mainly implicated in parts of the, uh, I would mean, say, uh, monitoring and rebuild phase. Uh, we were partnership uh, we were doing the, the, the pure investigation. And we were there to support and uh, do the security crisis monitoring, as I was saying. And uh, yes, the, the bridge phase to, to, to support uh, uh, the reopening of all the service to, to have the continuity of the activities of the, 
what's in the TV. The, the, the mention was for, for us that we, we had said few words uh, before that IT and OT, but yeah, it's, it was not purely IT because the, the, we, we were also in the kind of the OT world with everything related around the broadcast. And in fact, we need to secure and monitor not only the IT, the computer, the servers, which everybody is used to, but also to tackle the, the challenge we have to have the monitor, uh, I would say, transcends and uh, add some security overall the broadcast part, which was not totally or fully designed for. So this was one challenge we, we have to face, and I think over the years we, we still have some challenge on this specific business. We are not security driven at the beginning, and I think there is a lot of study or research can be done around the, the, the support, the security of broadcast, uh, broadcast stuff. Uh, we had the chance to, to have a lot of communication with, with them, and we have done, for example, a, a conference to get the feedback around the crisis management uh, at uh, Les Assises uh, 2015, which is a, a French uh, symposium, I would say, uh, which is running once a year. And uh, we, we have had the chance after to continue the access the journey with the device mode uh, because we are currently running the, the socks for, for them. Okay, and if we have a look at the filming three years, uh, uh, what uh, is uh, really uh, interesting to uh, understand is that uh, we will see a rise of new threats and also the ramp up of the cyber defense. And so, speaking about the threats, yeah. new threats, actually. Yes, new threats, but it's, it's, it's not a new era, I would say, but uh, that, that some new threats are gaining mainstream for, for, for this uh, decade, for this part. We have talked before that the Estonia menu was the entire service. We have talked about cyber page. Uh, with the Stuxnet and Shamun, we have talked about APT1, so it's almost spying uh, espionage. And here we are going to talk a little bit about uh, influence and another one just after, and uh, just 2016. Uh, a lot of hacking effort was done around the, the election, so the Clinton staffers was uh, targeting a phishing mail to get inside the, the, the American election and try to, to do some influence. So it was also uh, a new eyes of Brunner because this one was really. Uh, Famous also, so influence is part of the game as a cyber weapon uh, for the, the world at this uh, date. The, the other uh, the piece is, yeah, you can say one acquire and a picture. I, I, I won't say the rise of ransomware or the brand new ransomware because if you want to do some a little bit studies, you can find the first ransomware which could be uh, 1989 with uh, AIDS children. So, the rental world is an old stuff, I would say, but here is really the rise as the rental water as an industry, as a weapon to, to make money, and it's becoming mainstream. And this is a brand new part, and uh, they are able to, to move black worms, to trick uh, and to go from computer to other computer as easily as they, as they can do. So it's, it's a big changer because they are using the zero day or already existing vulnerabilities. Uh, they are tapping or targeting. Uh, from time to time, some specific company, but for most time, it could be for some or somewhere just opportunistic uh, target. And uh, yes, this is brand new and really important for, for us because it's uh, we go from uh, FPT, which it was just padding, and the target was to stay under the radar, I would say, for years. And this one is not exactly the same because it's quite of, as quick as possible. We want to cipher everything and to, to ask for. Uh, for money to, 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 to have your system up and running after, even if it's not always the case uh, after a month or one. So, this is a, yes, a new era for us because it's, uh, yes, as they can quickly as they go fast and they cyber everything. So, we don't have a lot of time to, to react. And then I spoke about the uh, ramp up of the cyber defense, and this is symbolized by, by the creation of the French Cyber Command. So this highlights that, that the cyber defense is growing as a global and strategic priority for the French Navy. And this confirms that uh, cyber is actually a new domain of action of, uh, of our warfare. So the cyber is in charge of coordinating the cyber activities inside the MOD, in charge of protecting the MODs uh, 
uh, infrastructures, but also in, in, in charge, and this is pretty new, but we'll see that later, of the offensive cyber and cyber information warfare. We'll come to that a bit later. And the strength of the cyber defense was also reinforced by the uh, following version of the military command law that was in 2019. And this uh, law strengthened the cyber defense regulations and imposed new uh, requirements on, uh, for example, uh, telecom service provider who, who need to have detection devices in, uh, to identify attacks on their customers and also to reinforce the resources and budgets for, uh, for cyber defense. On our side, we developed new tools to, uh, to, uh, to be more effective uh, with regards to cyber security attacks. Uh, I, I will speak quickly about the cyber range. This was initially an internal tool to support our uh, large programs, but this progressively grew into uh, some kind of agile and virtualized lab that was used for really various purposes, for example, for testing and evaluating uh, cyber products, uh, for uh, exercises and operational training, for simulating attacks on, uh, on uh, various systems. And uh, of course, for us, it's also a basis for our uh, innovation work, for our uh, organization of uh, events and uh, cyber uh, exercise about changes and so on. So this is really one of our uh, technological foundation, one of our uh, only, uh, very used uh, products. And then in 2017, we, we, we were awarded by the NSSI the passive qualification. I talked a bit about those qualifications earlier. So this one is for audits and pen tests. And uh, there are five uh, domains for this, uh, for this specific qualification. There is also a stronger version of the PASI uh, qualification that is really uh, compliant with the military program you know, for uh, critical national infrastructures and we got it at, uh, at the same time or a bit later, I think. And then another thing uh, happened in 2018, we developed, we implemented a site in uh, Rennes, so in the Britannia area, area. I talked to you earlier about the uh, Britannia ecosystem in terms of cyber security. We have people in Rennes since uh, 2015, but uh, in 2017-19 we opened a new site and uh, this is uh, something that is still growing, growing because last year we doubled the space that we, that we have in, uh, in uh, Britain. And we, we did that, of course, because of the ecosystem, because we wanted close to our customers, to our partners, to, uh, to the innovative uh, uh, landscape in Brittany to the academics and, uh, and Mark Oliver uh, knows that very well. And we, we have talked about the French a little bit, so I see one, I would say, big directive, the, the NIS directive, which was in 2016. It was the first step uh, in, in the European, uh, I would say, uh, cyber security strategy. That this one was trying to put some uh, some stuff we have already seen in the, the defense law, but it was pushed by, by various countries around Europe. This is one trend of Europe that we, we are trying to together to try to set up one common framework. And the, there was three main parts, I would say. Uh, the, the first one was to, to push for having some national uh, capabilities in each country, a kind of uh, national security agency or national. Uh, Computer security and cyber security for, for each country to, to be able to tackle attacks and to coordinate the, their industry. The second one was to push and stimulate cross border collaboration uh, between your countries. Uh, so the, the interconnection between the, the EU SAPs and uh, the, 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 the SAP from Europe also. And the, the third one was to uh, a strong focus on uh, national supervision of Critical sector to, to put measures and uh, supervise uh, national industry which are critical for, for the landscape. So, this, yes, it was the first stage with a little bit after. There is another uh, in Europe, but Nice is really the first strong step in the cyber security uh, strategy for Europe.
And still in Europe, uh, in 2018, the European uh, institution said that they, they, they were uh, needing sometimes tool to uh, to improve their security. So, so they released a, a framework contract to uh, allow uh, European institutions to protect themselves, uh, both uh, to uh, buy some expertise, to to buy some uh, security products, to buy some security projects. So there was a very big competition uh, for the European Commission. Actually, Airbus won it. So uh, uh, along with uh, with that talk, actually, but. Uh, Airbus is uh, is now uh, the, the the main uh, well, in charge of the delivery of uh, cyber security uh, uh, expertise and uh, products to the to the European institutions, and there are something like 17 European institutions that are uh, uh, using this contract, and we are uh, very proud of it. And then, if we come closer to our uh, to uh, the present day, actually, um, what we we see, uh, what we saw in the last uh, three years, I would say, that, what, is that there were new domains of cyber security uh, emerging, and uh, that the, the, the ecosystem also was uh, strengthening. So, uh, for example, we talked earlier about the cyber defense. This was released as a policy by the Commissioner in 2019. So this policy, of course, that's only the public elements of the policy, but it describes the organization and uh, the mission uh, of the Consider on cyber defense. And uh, so it shows that the approach is more and more structured. And uh, actually, in 2019, there were some uh, communication by the former uh, Minister of uh, Defense, Florence uh, Farley, and she said uh, in one of her speech that uh, the MOD was uh, under attack uh, quite uh, frequent, frequently, and uh, the attacks were, uh, she, she talked about were, uh, were from 2017, 2018, but still uh, it, was, uh, it was very uh, uh, interesting because um, the, the French body usually does not speak that much about uh, that kind of stuff. And then there they, they said that the attack was focused on the fuel supply chain for the Navy, for example, and they gave some, uh, some uh, information about how the, the attackers were, uh, were operating. So overall, this communication was, uh, was not uh, uh, well, innocent, I would say. It was meant to uh, show that the MOD was acknowledged that the, the risk was growing and that the re reaction was, uh, was necessary, in particular in the scope of the offensive cyber warfare. And guess what happened? Uh, in the following month, there was a new doctrine that was released uh, by the MOD for the offensive cyber warfare. And this doctrine is only public elements huh, because most of it is uh, classified, but it describes the usage the MOD can do of offensive cyber, and it describes also, also the legal framework of usage. So now offensive cyber is part of the panel of warfare capabilities of the MOD and can be employed in uh, operations. Um, the general message is that the French forces will use it, and though they will pay a very specific attention of the international legal framework, they, they won't fear to use it. Another thing that happened is that, and that's true, that was that's, uh, even more uh, recent, uh, that in 2021, that the, the fact that uh, fake news uh, started to take a very big importance in, in our country. In 2021, for example, uh, the, the French forces uh, suffered uh, from uh, disinformation in, uh, in the Mali operations, for example. Uh, obviously, this is a new topic, because it was, uh, it was already used uh, in the Roman Empire, but uh, the fact that uh, the there are some social networks is, is a real major shift because 
it melts uh, the disk information on 1,000 times louder and that allows 1,000 more people to be able to release uh, false information. And uh, that the French forces learned uh, uh, on, the, on the battlefield actually. Uh, and uh, and uh, some rumors were spread about the, the social networks and the, the local population uh, was really um, 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 well, uh, led to thinking that, uh, that uh, the French forces were doing things that they were not doing actually. And uh, the bigger it is, the more people believe it. So it was, we were speaking about uh, eye openers. This was also an eye opener of what uh, misinformation, disinformation, cyber influence can do in, uh, in, uh, in the mafia context. And uh, by the way, at the end of 2021, there was a new doctrine of cyber information warfare. So this is something that is very, very relevant for the uh, nowadays. On our study in 2019, we joined the Cyber CNI chair. And, uh, thanks for that, Mark uh, Lebauer. Pretty very proud of that. And then we got the PDIS qualification. So, so this PDIS qualification was uh, very difficult to, uh, to get because it imposes to our uh, security operations center to have a very strong infrastructure and the very small processes. But this opened the road to providing uh, security monitoring services to the CNIs uh, and uh, that to, to, to answer the requirements from the NSSI. So it's very important to, to have this qualification. Attacks against the hospitals, I think that uh, everybody knows about that. Huh? This is uh, something that uh, happened in the US in, uh, firstly, and then it came to France at the end of 2019, 2020, you could say. And uh, actually, uh, this is a still uh, up to, uh, an up-to-date uh, topic uh, today. Uh, we can see that uh, in every, uh, every day in, uh, in the new newspapers. Uh, in 2020, uh, seven, 27 hospitals were attacked in, uh, in France, and it's still uh, ongoing. So this is mostly uh, ransomware attacks, but it's choked us all because uh, it has something to do with uh, human lives and the human lives were at stake. So this. This is also some, some kind of change in the mindset, mindset of uh, attackers. Mindset. Another important thing in uh, 2020 was uh, the, the launch of the France Runners plan. So this was at the beginning of the COVID uh, um, crisis. And the plan de relance is mostly a recovery, recovery plan was, uh, was meant to reduce the economic impact of the COVID uh, sanitary crisis, but on the cyber security part, uh, there, there was also a specific plan driven by the uh, NC and focused on local communities, public institutions, and uh, health care facilities, uh, and especially uh, hospitals. So, probably in 2021, uh, more than 600 entities, different entities, benefited for, uh, from uh, this plan to increase their maturity in, uh, in cyber. And another thing that is worth mentioning, and that's the creation of the campus uh, cyber, so it was in 2021, and uh, we uh, had a cyber uh, during the campus beginning of 2022 when the, the premises were, uh, were opened. And so this is a, an interesting initiative, and started uh, directly by the president, uh, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, and uh, it meant that uh, Developing synergies between uh, all the actors of cyber security in the, in the Paris, uh, Paris uh, area, promoting sharing information, training, innovation, and so on. Yeah, during this year, this year we had the chance to uh, joint or effort, I would say, with the others in a research program. So you have two examples here, which is Safe Care and Satchel. 
uh, I won't spend too much time on these two models. You can Google the names and uh, go to the website, which is dedicated to these two topics, and you will see that we, we are able to plus a lot of other partners from industry and uh, research and, and universities and others. Uh, but these two examples, uh, it, it proves that they, in Europe is pushing also for collaboration between countries on, on specific studies. The staff care was uh, all about the healthcare, so we, we try to support hospital in this case, uh, for example, part of the studies we have done was to try to analyze specific file format with uh, uh, outcome from the scanners, for example, so we were able to, to, to scan either as malware, which is embedded in these specific file formats, but we were part with the uh, consortium uh, 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 seamless integration, the target for the seamless integration between uh, say the OT of the physical part and the IT of uh, an hospital to have uh, I would say a broader view of what's running on the security level in, in, uh, in a hospital or healthcare or environment. The SATIE, I would say, it's, uh, it's, it's the same purpose. The target was also to tackle the security, physical one, and the uh, IT security and OT security uh, in the same, uh, I would say, dashboard to have a broad view, and it was related to airport. Uh, for the we were in, in Liverpool with the Athen airport for, for, for these studies. And uh, the, the target was just to to prove that we can have a, a, a broader view on specific uh, duties and OT part of this airport infrastructure, which is much more complex than what we, people can see uh, when you are just going to take your plans and to connect all security users from physical to IT and to IT together to have a broader view. And also this one was done with the consortium. You can find it in, in, if you Google in the internet, uh, the name. It was done thanks to European uh, research framework also. So the Europe is pushing, is putting some money on its part to, to support their industries. And not only for uh, the civilian industries, but also, uh, also uh, for the military purpose, uh, the, the, this one is the uh, EDIDP, uh, European uh, Defense and Industrial Development Program, uh, which is now uh, the European Defense Fund, uh, because the gentleman has changed it and the absolute level of investment uh, has changed. And the, the, the IDBM was to uh, the first initiative to uh, join various uh, military actors from various countries in Europe to put their efforts in common to develop some new I would say two service or uh, products together uh, as a strong Europe to deliver some stuff that can be used not only by your national country but in outside your country for, for the other. So we were part of uh, one uh, one project uh, around the, around this one, which is called uh, STLAP, which uh, you can find also in, in the internet. And the goal of this one is what to I would say. Uh, uh, concentrate the, the data you've got from all your uh, systems and you have a, a situational awareness so just you are able to tell the users what's running on the system and take the right decision uh, to, to tackle at the best the, the, the issue and this one is the European Consortium is uh, yes, research and also uh, uh, industrial partners. Okay, so that's a lot of information. That's where we stand today. So we, we saw how the structure of uh, cyber defense uh, has grown uh, in France and has been built uh, through a set of uh, very strong uh, political decisions. And uh, how we in uh, other uh, cyber have uh, developed our activity to support uh, the, the evolution of our uh, customer needs. But of course, that's not the end of the story. And the states are our. Uh, are we changing and evolving uh, every day? So, uh, to uh, close this uh, speech, we will uh, give you a few hints at uh, of what we think the stakes will be in, uh, in, the, in different domains in the next year. For defense, so the battlefield in the next decade and probably decades uh, will change. And we evolve towards what is called the multi domain combat cloud. So, uh, this is a battlefield where uh, all the headquarters, forces, weapon systems uh, will be connected together in uh, near real time uh, to provide the right information at the right time to the right people. So, uh, this creates really new states for cybersecurity because 
this is really a digital digitalization push push to the to the extreme, and uh, the surface of exposure will uh, is going to grow uh, really uh, quite a lot. So that will uh, require to develop some uh, cyber defense systems uh, on board the platforms, on board military systems, on board uh, aircraft, on board vehicles, and so on. And uh, we need to uh, to adapt to new technologies such as the, the cloud that uh, should be uh, generalized on uh, on the battlefield, and and of course new communication means because the bandwidth uh, requirements will uh, grow quite a lot. So these are the stakes that we are uh, preparing to address with our colleagues in uh, Airbus Defence and Space. Yeah, at Europe level, we are seeing that the IOB yeah, the NIST V01, and currently uh, the, the NIST V2 is currently reviewing uh, by the, the, the European institution, and uh, that, that will enforce uh, one step ago uh, to try to support the critical national industries in Europe to enforce that a, a minimum level of security is part of the design and the run phase of all these industries. So it's really a strong push. They will also tackle the cyber security certification of products. So we will have a, a common certification in Europe. So then they, they, we, we, we going a little bit closer to your European security market. Uh, that's just uh, before we were used to have one security product which has to be set for each country. You, you, we are getting to, to sell almost there is some cross collaboration, but this one is it, stronger because they, they are pushing for uh, just one level, which is a uh, security level, which is enforced in the whole Europe. Uh, we have the, the, the EU Cyber Security Act, we have the brand new uh, Cyber Resilience Act, so also, which was uh, discussed a uh, few weeks before the, the, this talk. So, the Europe has a strong strategy and wants to push as well for, I would say, a human eye as a citizen, but also the critical national industries to enforce the security and the, the, of the product service uh, uh, which are delivered to everybody inside the European uh, region. And About territories, local communities, and things. So, uh, what we saw along the, the last 10 years was that uh, maturity in terms of cyber security for the big, big actors, large organizations, ha has grown uh, significantly. But uh, at the same time, it's uh, always still more difficult for uh, smaller uh, organizations, for SMEs and so on, because they, uh, they don't have the people, they don't have the, the money, they don't have the budget to, uh, to structure their uh, their production. Uh, so we saw that, that there were some uh, good initiatives, so such as the plan of relance, huh, to, to increase this maturity level, but uh, still it has to, uh, to be maintained and uh, increased. And uh, it is uh, still, I think, a concern for the years to come, and uh, probably it will uh, um, have an impact on the future uh, regulations. Uh, and, and, Possibly the uh, European directives on, uh, on cyber security. Yeah, human resources, of course, because uh, it's really part of the game. And uh, currently, we, we, we are seeing uh, when facing the, the, the COVID crisis that uh, uh, most of us have the chance to be more remote office rather than uh, in the office. So, uh, uh, most companies are getting used to have spontaneous time before launch for remote. So the competition is not only a national one, it's not anymore just a European one for resources, but it's an international one. Uh, we have seen some people which were the IF5 company who are outside Europe, and just you, you don't have the barrier to leave to go uh, in another country. So the, the, the more in the future rather than it was in the past, that uh, human resources that, uh, is, is not just a national problem. It's, uh, Yes, we need to enforce the attractivity of uh, what we are doing. We also need to uh, support the fact that we have more young talents which are coming to cyber security because we, we are missing a lot of resources. So we, we try to go to, uh, up to schools to, to get uh, and, uh, and, uh, just put the spirit of cyber, which is fun and interesting stuff because there's a really a, a wide landscape that you are able to cover. But also we are pushing for more diversity of course, there's a diversity of uh, women in cyber. So there is a national uh, we see women from cyber, which we are, uh, so, uh, we, we are part of 
part of the we have women which are pushing for for this one it's really important but also the world diversity not only women and it's really also a strong push from the side and we, we try to open as much as possible but human resources is really uh, key for the future we need to train and to retain the, the people inside this really interesting topic And the last part we wanted to um, to highlight the the paper is mainly on the main topic, innovating, analyzing, and uh, everybody can do everything. So uh, this is why uh, ecosystems are important uh, to uh, leverage each other's uh, achievements and to be able to. Uh, to, uh, to get uh, stronger capabilities. So we, we saw them growing the ecosystems now uh, through the cyber uh, code of excellence, through the cyber plant web, uh, because uh, they are uh, also uh, spreading in, uh, in uh, our country. They are already playing a major role in uh, cyber security to, to combine the action of the state, of the industrials, of the academics. But, uh, uh, we, we, what we think is that uh, this is not the end of it, and they will uh, grow even further in the years to come uh, at the national level, but most probably also at, uh, at the European level. And this is it. This was uh, the main uh, highlights and uh, the main, main, main story we wanted to, uh, to tell you today. But uh, you learned a few things, and, uh, and uh, maybe gave you a uh, a um, better overview about uh, how cyber was prepared in France on the last year. Mm. Perfect. Thank you very much, Big Applause, um, uh, replacing the uh, real audience uh, with me today. Um, yeah, so it was very interesting, and I, I really loved your slides. And this was a very, very nicely crafted and a very nice elements that you put and very nice structure. Um, so Alex will moderate the questions in order to give him uh, a few more seconds to structure them. Uh, let me start with the first question. Um, the first question is, Airbus is uh, truly a European uh, company with, uh, with uh, France and uh, Germany the, uh, the drivers uh, there. And, um, when you think about cybersecurity, cybersecurity has no frontiers in the sense that uh, French cybersecurity is different from, uh, or has to be different from German cybersecurity because um, French companies are attacked differently than uh, German companies. So, could, could you say something about the different cultures working on cybersecurity and the different threat landscapes or perceptions in the two countries? Uh, I don't know if you have experience from the two countries, but um, or if not, like in Europe overall, so is there a difference between uh, Hungary, for instance, or France in the perception of some security threats and in the uh, handling of some threats and the activities that they do? Yes, there's so much to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, maybe I'll start and then you can uh, complement. First thing is that uh, most probably the Threat landscape is uh, similar in all countries, for sure. And then there is a matter of perception, and there is a matter also of uh, sovereignty, because uh, we, uh, uh, both of us, are working in, uh, in the um, uh, domains that are close to defense, and in both domains, we are working. Uh, Mostly in a, in a national approach and uh, national styles, and it's very difficult at the moment to uh, to exchange uh, um, technologies, to exchange uh, uh, projects, know-how uh, between the country. But uh, still, uh, there are some uh, some new uh, elements that uh, allow us to uh, to work at the Euro European uh, level, and especially the growth uh, of uh, European Defence Fund is kind of a new thing and that it happened only uh, two or three years ago uh, for the first ones. And uh, this is uh, something that uh, um, I think would benefit to, to, uh, to the uh, European cyber security and uh, the defense uh, uh, because it will allow to have a kind of twofold approach. First, at European level, 
with things that we can share, and there are things that we can share. And then the second level at national level for things that we don't want to share. And there will, follow, there will always be things that, uh, that we won't, won't, won't want to share at national level. Mm -hmm. Nicola? Um, I just want to do that. Uh, except, uh, yes, we were used to have uh, yes, socks and yes, swimming computers for the friends the UK and Germany. And at the end of the day, the cyber attack doesn't stop at the frontier, then they, they, they go above and uh, they, we are pretty doing the same stuff, the same business in, in each country. Just for sure, the, the national, uh, I would say, uh, enforcement and uh, priorities may be a little bit different from one country to another. That we have, but we are seeing that the UN regulation is pushing all the countries to uh, try to have a, a minimum, uh, I would say, a good level of security. So everybody uh, try to, to play the, the right game. So I don't think there is so much difference between all countries. The military part is a very uh, specific one but for the civilian market. Uh, the, we need to, to tackle the European market together rather than uh, having small silos uh, between each other. But otherwise, they, yes, we are tackling the same issues with the same uh, human rights, so uh, lacking of people, the same uh, threats which are without any frontiers. So um, no, no big difference at the end of the day. And we are collaborating, yes, quite easily with all those, those new project, uh, military or civilian one in uh, Europe, for example. The, the consortium is always uh, a lot of people from various countries in Europe and uh, we, we managed to deliver great uh, stuff uh, at the end of the day. Yes, it's uh, true that, uh, well, I was uh, focused on the military part, but uh, only companies such as Airbus, uh, the, yeah, the, the, the internal organization to, uh, for uh, security, uh, for the security uh, activities is really uh, transnational, and uh, borders uh, don't don't, uh, don't are not relevant uh, for those organizations. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot for the answer. So, Alex, I hand over to you. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you, my colleague. Thank you both, Nicolas, for this presentation. There were a lot of questions, but you proactively answered lots of them, so that's quite convenient. So, I will try to regroup them by thematics, I would say. So, the first question will be. What role do you see for state and private actors for cyber security? Um, it's to really the question because the, the, yeah. it's quite the question I think is, a, is about more uh, does cyber security is more a company affair or, or um, state affairs? I would not say it. it's an affair of everybody because they, currently the, the cyber domain is not stopping at the end of your office, at the end of the military or governmental offices, it's going up to your own life. So uh, there is a part of mix between the collaboration between uh, say, the, the national uh, regulation part and uh, some companies. And we are seeing during the, the past that, uh, for example, the IPT1 was discovered by a private company, which has given some uh, threat in touch to the whole community. So I really think that, that there is a balance between the both sectors, and we, we need, we have to work together for a, a safer cyber security world, I would say. And uh, yes, for sure, the, the national part has the regulation, but uh, the, 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 the industry has the, the, the part to check. Uh, to be part of and to be less part of the solution. So that is the best for most, definitely. Okay. Well, uh, um, um, actually, the, the majority of, uh, of big organization, private organization, has, has, has a re reason really directly in our, our, in the last 10 years uh, when we started our, our business in, well, in 2012 or 13. Uh, very few companies knew what a SOC was, for example, and uh, now it's really uh, straightforward. And uh, the company has grown their maturity in terms of risk management and the cyber security risk. I think that in every uh, um, executive committee in the big companies, uh, right now that the, the cyber security risk is identified, is seen, is uh, managed at company level. But at the same time, the national institutions, uh, we saw that uh, 
they are very proactive even because they have other uh, objectives. And our objective is to have, is to have a, a nation that is working and they don't care whether some companies uh, understand that there is a risk or not. They are putting in place some regulations to, to make sure that at the, the nation level, the cybersecurity risk is handled. So there, there is a really the, the need for both. But uh, I think the, the, the uh, national authority are there to, to push those who uh, have, did not understand uh, soon, uh, soon enough. Thank you for this answer. And to complete my former question, uh, there were two questions, I think quite similar. Uh, in France, the military plays a central role for cyber security. How is it in other countries? And the other question was, what is the role of regular citizens regarding cyber security in Europe? So both role of military and regular citizens for cyber security. Yeah. Currently, the, 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 very, very different between the, the military part and uh, I would say the European citizen and uh, uh, some other country like like France and some in Italy, for example. There's a difference between military parts and civil parts. The, the, the difference of the civil part of the critical national industry is done by some specific institution which are different than the military one. So most of the time you have a, a split between the two, which is which is great. So that's that my answer. And for the citizen, uh, the, the question is, is why, but uh, the, the, as I said, the best part is to be aware of what is uh, uh, various uh, phishing or stuff like that. For example, uh, I'm proud that currently uh, the, my, my mother did receive specific uh, messages, which is weird. Uh, she asked no uh, before uh, just click on, on this message. So it does uh, no one to the world citizen to be aware of what is phishing, what are some minutes or some threats, I would say, uh, because it's part of the, the, of the, of the game to, to, to raise the awareness of everybody. And the other party for us is try to to get part of the citizen, which are, are I would say, uh, skilled or are willing to, to jump to the cyber story, to, to be part of the, the, the tea industry or the military or the national institution to, to protect their, their, their country in the cyber world, I would say. Okay. Thank you for the answer. Another question, which is a bit related but not so much. Uh, do you think it is better to disclose the cyber security incidents or to remain silent? I think the question was about if the attacker does not know that you speak about the attack, maybe they have no information, no feedbacks. So it is better to say nothing and uh, correct the attack or just to say everything uh, to uh, share intelligence. I think it's better to share with the community uh, what's running to tell your friends what can happen in their premises uh, so that you, you, you can be less asymmetrical, as I said, uh, because the attacker may not be able to use a same trick for everybody. Uh, but uh, I won't uh, do it for everything publicly. Uh, we are doing some, uh, I would say, feedbacks uh, after. Uh, uh, during the, the presentation that we have made a short feedback at, uh, at a symposium for, for the TV5 uh, story. But we are doing so when everything is over and everything is under control. From time to time, there are also legal action which are behind, so we are not allowed to talk about this one. So I, I do really a, a different session between I say, the public disclosure and in the community of uh, researchers or uh, defenders. Uh, but for this community, it's great to share uh, as soon as you, you are able to share so that they can protect their, I would say, own perimeters. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to add, adding something that would you say we have enough sharing already. I'm especially thinking about this uh, that we are also working on uh, disclosing cybersecurity information in a way that you do not share the secrets of your company, of your infrastructure, and so on. So, automating things in that direction to foster even more sharing, because I personally have the impression that um, there could yet be more increase in this sharing and that would strengthen the key offender side. Um, yeah, do you have a comment on that? 
Yeah, and this is the, the evolution of the regulation in Europe is pushing that uh, national industry has to uh, submit that they are under attack to the national security agencies. And as I said before, the, the European CERT has to uh, do some joint effort and collaboration. So they are able, through this uh, I would say, official way of exchanging to exchange and to support their own industry to protect them. So there are already some channels in place to, to those kind of exchanges. Thank you. So now I have two questions about business and money, so I will regroup them. Uh, do you think the investment made in cybersecurity is equivalent to the money raised by cybercrime? So is it enough money, uh, are there yeah, enough investments by companies in cybersecurity rather than uh, money gained on cybercrimes on attacks? That's a tough one. <laughs> Well, I don't have the figures on uh, cybercrime, actually. The, the question on the companies, it's really a question of, uh, of uh, risk management uh, from my uh, viewpoint. Uh, because uh, well, what, what has changed, of course, is that companies are uh, investing uh, quite a lot in, uh, in, uh, in cyber uh, security. Uh, we, asked, uh, we had some, uh, some practical uh, examples of what cyber security attacks could cost to a company, uh, if we uh, see at uh, Renault, saint Bernard and so on. And uh, so now the, the value of the risk uh, in the, the, the executive committees is more or less uh, known. Uh, we know that it's uh, for big, big companies, uh, it's a matter of several hundreds of millions of euros. So that's, that's up to this uh, point that the company invest in, in their, in their uh, cyber security. And to draw a comparison with uh, the, the money from the cyber crime, uh, it's a bit uh, difficult for me. And I don't know if you have a... No, no, no. I know that then uh, what well, about you are going to part of the... Do, do we have enough money? If you tell the, the, the team, they will always claim that they need more money. But the, the reality is uh, that, that we have to put the efforts on uh, through what is pushing or at least in front of the National Security Agency to, the NSSI, to do the risk analysis, to, to put the efforts at the right level, where it's a bit close, I would say. Uh, but uh, yeah, I cannot uh, answer fully to the question, unfortunately. Sorry for that. Okay, thank you. A few questions now about uh, the targets of cyber attacks. Uh, are small or medium companies more targeted by cyber attacks than big, big groups? And uh, what is the most targeted industry for ransomware and why? Honestly, from this beginning, I don't have the figures with me. Uh, I, I don't know them back up, so I can't just swerve. Uh, I'm not willing to, to do a mistake, but uh, there is two types of attack. I would say some are really targeting some industry. It's not a question of sectors, it's a question of uh, uh, can you access to the industry for a ransom? And uh, is it bankable, I would say? Uh, and so some group are just targeting some specific industry sector who delivers some product with added value with a, a huge business. Some others are the, just trying to, like the script it is, uh, just scanning the internet. If there is a binary which is open inside the internet, they will try to use it. And after, uh, if you, you don't have a, a, a huge uh, set number, I uh, will claim for a new element. If you have a, a huge one, I will claim for a huge one. It's more opportunistic. So you have both uh, in the cyber crime. And uh, I said that unfortunately, there is no big blocker for them. They, 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 you have various people which are doing various cyber crime at those levels. I think that's the figure we see. Okay. Yeah, I have a few questions again. Uh, there will be a, a bit of geopolitical question, I will say. Uh, did the situation in Ukraine affect your work? Did it introduce new priorities or challenges, especially as Airbus is also active in the defense sector? Uh, we don't know about geopolitical stuff, so okay. I will not take this question, sorry. Okay. And uh, is there one other, I don't know, quite general question about do you know what are the countries that are the more attacked and the countries that are that attacks more? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's still the same answer as the other side in that the more okay. in my in my mind. Uh, I cannot answer with any mistakes, sorry for that. 
Okay, no problem. So more general questions. So uh, who is the target group for fake news? Who is the target group for fake news? Who is targeted for fake news? So the, the question gets into the direction, is it for um, public bodies? Is it general public? Is it companies? Because uh, when you go to uh, these different entities, you might um, see different types of fake news. Is there trends that you see uh, that today it's mainly general public for manipulating elections or it's the uh, so intelligence community to, to, to deviate uh, their information? I don't know if you, can, if you have some experience there or if you can disclose something in that direction. Cool. Yeah, on my side, I don't have the figures of the well, targeted group. Actually, this is not, um, not the, the art of our uh, business, uh, this information. This is beginning to be part of our business, especially on the military side, because this is quite new. And I think that on the, the, the private sector side, it's probably something that, uh, that was uh, where well, the companies are uh, more mature because uh, they need to. Uh, to um, well, they pay attention to the social networks uh, because it can affect their business and so on. The, the, the risk is very wide and large because it can be a risk uh, both on, uh, on the, the value of their uh, uh, shares, uh, yeah. it can be a risk on their image, it can be a risk on uh, lots of things already. We are already seeing several times that just a simple tweet can change the, the, the share value from a company. So yeah. it's part of the influence, but uh, we can then share figures because we don't have them. And so far, just prevent, I would say, under the radars, those which are more public. We have from time to time some examples, but uh, most of the time, this is the companies themselves or the, the government, which are, but they have the right scoring, but we, we don't have access to the full picture of this one. But, uh, but on the military side, it's really uh, new and it's spreading and it's very effective because uh, uh, in uh, spreading rumors on a few social networks, uh, you can have a local, manipulate actually people, manipulate create a lot of people inside the local population so that they get out of, out of their home and they stop a military convoy. So that's really very uh, effective and uh, very. Uh, uh, cheap, <laughs> actually. So uh, that's uh, that's something that uh, that is uh, will grow in uh, in the future for, for sure. It's very, very difficult also to uh, fight against because it's a matter of um, of how words to react. Once the rumor is widespread, then it's too late. It's too late to uh, to answer. It's too late for communication. It's too late to to contain it uh, also. Okay, so now we have only three questions, and the two last one will be quite funny, in my opinion. So the first one is, what is the role of certification for public security? Yeah. The, the main role of certification for cyber security is to ensure that you have raised your product or your service at the minimum level which is expected. And uh, in the European scheme, you have several levels of uh, Yes, the cyber, uh, uh, I would say, uh, level uh, from one to, to three, uh, which have different names. But the target is to, to have a proof uh, that the product has been, or the service has been evaluated by an external body uh, without any influence. So you will have again a day stamp that is proving that you have reached the expected level. That's the target. So give having more trust and the exactly. product. That's, that's the right one. That's trust. It's a you can use uh, a speed provider or, or device to protect you, you need to trust it, and that's what the certification provides. Okay, thank you. So, a question about your timeline that you've presented. So, it begins in the 2008 year, and there were two questions about quite old, I would say now, uh, attacks. The Y2K bug or, vi or virus, as we kind of learned. It can be abused, and the I love you worm. So, wasn't this kind of a problem a security, cyber security issues? And does Airbus have, have uh, uh, been asked to answer this kind of issues? So, the way to k bug and the I love you worm. 
Yes, for, for the first part, we, we have decided to start uh, around 2008, I would say, because the, it was part of the beginning of the, I would say, the journey for, for our company, because uh, we have said it, Denver started uh, a center of competence, but in fact, there is already a first, uh, I would say, a new start or only beginning a few years before. We can have started, uh, I would say, 20 years ago with all the values that I would it was not the purpose of the presentation. Uh, some really highlighted uh, stuff which have, uh, were just tackling some specific, yes, Estonia, it was a whole country uh, against a, a huge uh, denial series which had challenged the, 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 what has done in Estonia after uh, the other sabotage. It was really strong uh, sabotage was targeting at the beginning some specific industries. There were some others of, uh, such as the bug of the UK or I love you. So, targeting uh, some of these stuff, so it's, that, that's the reason why we have chosen this example for me, uh, because it was very uh, a big stress on some, uh, I said, dedicated uh, targets or action or of means, uh, rather than the generic uh, vulnerabilities which we have seen, we, we can have added, uh, I would say, hundred of uh, all the malware, which was not the, the target of the presentation. Okay, and to conclude, um Public questions, even if there were more, but some of them were answered at the same time in your presentation. Uh, when will we have 100% cyber security? Yeah. <laughs> I, it, it, will, it will always be a, a target for the, the, the whole industry, for the sector of our products, but uh, we are never being world and uh, enabling world is also enabling IT, so we will have also evolving threat over time. So I would say, unfortunately, we will still have a, a business, a job to, to support cybersecurity over time. Uh, because I think, unfortunately, it's a kind of endless, what we say, uh, we, we will still have to fight against and, uh, in this moving world. So it's a permanent fight. Okay, thank you for your answers and back to you, Marco Lima, for the next one. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful discussion. The time, is, the time is almost up. I just want to profit with the idea. The last um, personal question for both of you, maybe. What is the most positive memory you have from these 10 years? Is there something that happened uh, that you would, would want to highlight that, uh, that was a really nice in this journey creating Amber Cybersecurity? You already talked about the people, and that I can only confirm, so with everybody I'm working with, that uh, Amber Cybersecurity is always a pleasure. Um, exchanging and driving ideas and spinning ideas, so it's, it's a really great opportunity. Yeah, thanks a lot um, for that. So, what, what would you say? It, it can be a funny thing, it can be a minor thing. So, do you have, do you have a highlight, what's a personal highlight that you want to emphasize? I think we should run on because uh, there are uh, lots of memories uh, of uh, the last 10 years, you have a million on your side, I would say, I'm not sure it's a funny one, but um, after we developed about uh, 35 uh, months, uh, for me it was especially given because uh, I would say, yes, it was a crisis, it's not great for, for the, the world which is under attack, but uh, um, I had the chance to be part of this, and when I said this, it was part of the remediation. Uh, and which was pretty good because we were doing part of crisis management and remediation. And this can only be done with the human you are with you. And this was really specific because uh, I said we were not counting our hours uh, on premises, but everybody, despite the situation, was always in a good mood and in a, in a way to try to uh, say fight against the, the stress and to deliver the, the services so we can recover. So, it was for me a, a human experience because uh, under pressure you, you, you can, I would say, so we are together and we want to fight together against the, the, I said the, 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 the threat. And so those of may, uh, yes, I would say, try to find who is going to be why and the reason why we don't know. It, it was very a human adventure. Everybody inside the company, uh, in the Airbus for all the team, because we have a lot of remote people uh, in Airbus working on this one, and inside the, the the team from TB5 because uh, everybody was yes close together. We were really one joint team with all the suppliers and uh, the, 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 the details of the delivering something against, I would say, the cybercrime. So, yeah. 
Uh, on my side, I, I had the kind of vacuum because I had the time to think about it. So that's not a very necessarily a very good memory, but uh, that's a memory about people also, uh, because um, that's when the actually the, the COVID crisis started, uh, and uh, uh, we are uh, a very sensitive business. We are working on a ministry program and so on. And then, uh, from the day to the other, we, we were asked to leave our uh, our uh, offices and to try to make the business uh, carry on. And I, actually, it worked uh, owing to the, the people and the fact that they, they found uh, solutions and uh, that that we just never thought about uh, before to work from their uh, from their own and ensure the business continuity. So that's a very uh, marking uh, memory for me. Yeah, very nice, very nice. So, yeah, as I said before, so for me it was uh, super interesting and super great uh, seeing uh, the journey, the highlights of the journey that you picked, and also seeing the outlook of uh, different areas that, that might be uh, interesting ones in the, in the upcoming years. Um, I think we can all say that, as, as you already said, also cybersecurity will continue being important, it will grow in importance, and therefore we'll uh, probably not be unemployed. And uh, we are also always looking. <laughs> On the sides, so yeah, <laughs> this is sure. Cool. So thanks again. A big applause also here. We had uh, quite some audience. We still had uh, some uh, some more questions. Thanks a lot to Alex uh, for the great moderation. Thanks a lot to Enzo for the moderation of the YouTube stream. Um, as usual, the video will be available online um, directly after. So uh, please share it also with your friends. Subscribe to the channel and. Uh, yeah, look at it again and uh, also we'll put some more questions to the video or send us your questions and uh, we'll forward them to, uh, to Nicolas and uh, yeah, maybe we'll have some interesting discussion. The next edition or also important a possibility if you want to meet us will be at the European Cyber Week which will be on from the 15th to the 17th of November. We will all be in uh, REN and this is a big cybersecurity event in REN. Apples will have to stand there. We, as the chair, would probably also have the possibility to be present on the 16th of November, uh, which is a Wednesday. We'll have even a dedicated session for the chair, also with Airbus and our other industry partners. So, if you manage to come to REN, if you're interested in cybersecurity, meeting companies, discussing on the issues, continuing the discussion with us, do not miss it. Come over. Participation in the event is free, you have to register, but you can come over and participate. So uh, we highly recommend that and cordially invite you to do so. And uh, yeah, next edition of the series will be on the 21st of October at uh, 2 o'clock. We'll have Gabi Drio from the University of Armed Forces. I'll produce the trailer with her in the next week, so it will be also online then. Take care, um, stay safe, and uh, see you all in two weeks. Uh, Thanks again to Nicolas Rossi and Nicolas Florio. And uh, yeah, see you soon. Bye bye. See you. Bye. Cher Cyber CNU d'excellence, Richard Bretagne. Au revoir et à la prochaine.